Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, it's so great to see everyone here. Um, my name is Ingrid Agley. I'm a professor at the law school um, and also faculty director of the criminal justice program. And so it's my privilege to um, introduce and moderate this wonderful panel. Um, the title of our panel is Different Enforcement and Disparate Impacts of Gun Laws. Um, and we have four amazing panelists that I'm just going to introduce um, briefly before getting started. Um, our first panelist is um, Sharon Mitchell, who's the chief um, public defender for um, Cook County in Illinois. Um, he began his career um, in the Cook County Public Defender's Office, um, and in 2021 was sworn in as the chief of the office. Cook County is one of the largest public defender offices um, in the nation. Um, with just over 700 um, employees in it. Um, and he's been doing a fabulous job um, leading that office, and we're going to hear about some of the work that he's doing there. Um, our next panelist um, is Professor David Olson, um, who's a professor um, at Loyola University of, in Chicago um, and also serves as co-director um, of the Interdisciplinary Center for Criminal Justice um, at Loyola. Um, and he's also very involved in a whole range of um, criminal justice related um, committees um, and advisory boards um, in the state of Illinois, um, including serving as chair of the advisory board for the Illinois Department of Corrections. Um, our third panelist um, is Melissa, uh, Professor Melissa Barragan, who's an assistant professor at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, um, professor Barragan has a PhD in criminology from um, University of California, Irvine's distinguished um, program in criminal um, criminal law, um, criminal law and sociology department, um, and she, her research um, appropriately focuses on many of the issues we'll be talking today, including gun violence, incarceration, um, and community-based um, community, community-based interventions. Our fourth panelist um, is Professor Sarah Brito, who's um, an assistant professor at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Um, she earned her PhD in criminology. Um, and criminal justice from Florida State University. Um, and her research um, really focuses on the forces that shape crime. Um, and a lot of that research focuses on public perceptions. And so that will really be helping us to have important insights to the questions that we're discussing today. Um, so just to start us out, um, I wanted to start out by turning um, to Chief Mitchell. Um, you, um, you know, were, were really outspoken when the Bruin case was being argued, um, and I understand that you um, came out in support of a group of New York State public defenders who authored an amicus brief that's received a lot of attention um, that was on the side and supporting the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association before the Supreme Court. Um, I know you've authored an op-ed piece um, and spoken um, to the press in a number of different forums. Um, and some, some people may think that's sort of, you know, per, perhaps surprising, right, that public defenders would um, side on the side of, you know, other groups that, that, are, that are in favor of gun rights like the NRA. Um, so we wanted to um, just have you start out this conversation that really sparked the idea for this particular panel um, and help us to understand, you know, how public defenders come out on this issue um, and the communities that you represent, um, you know, support the views that you've taken. So thank yeah. you for starting us out. Yeah, well, thank you all so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Cook County is in Chicago, for you guys that don't know, so it's getting cold there. So the opportunity to get into the uh, super warm Big Ten school is just super attractive to me, um, being an Illinois guy. Um, so listen, I, um, you know, thinking about this question, it's difficult for me to not think about um, a buddy of mine, a guy I grew up with. Um, uh, he... Uh, we grew up. We grew up together. Uh, I'm about 40 years old. Uh, he, uh, you know, at 16, 17 years old, uh, picked up, got in trouble, picked up a case, got got it taken care of, no big deal. Uh, became a uh, union union worker, union union, union professional. I uh, don't want to disclose his position, uh, but uh, you know, really, you know, you know, was doing really well. At, at about 35 years old, uh, he just got a new job. And he decided that he wanted to apply for a gun license. Now, it's funny that you say that I'm siding with the NRA because I'm not a gun person, right? I don't, 
I believe the research that suggests that, you know, guns make domestic violence and suicide and just everyday conflicts more lethal. Um, with that said, he made the decision. Um, I understand it. You know, you turn on the TV in Chicago and you are inundated with news about carjackings and shootings. And although uh, the news outpaces the actual, uh, you know, situation on the street, people are scared. So in this new job, he had to go in, in and out of houses um, around where we live on the south side. So he decided to, to, get a, to get a gun license. He applied for that gun license. And he was rejected based upon this thing that happened from before he was 20 years old. Um, wasn't even a conviction. So he's in a position where he can do one of two things. He can uh, choose not to protect himself against something I don't think is a really smart idea, but he decides to make it, or uh, you know, carry illegally. And I don't know the answer, but I suspect that he's decided to carry illegally, right? So uh, Ill illegally. So um, take that to kind of what I see as the public defender of Cook County. We have almost 100,000 cases um, each year in a non-pandemic year. And about 25% of our felony cases are, almost 25% of our felony cases are gun possession cases. Uh, the Illinois criminal code is, is about this thick, but one offense essentially counts for one type of offense, essentially counts for about one quarter of the cases, and what I see, and what our attorneys see every day, you know, we, you know, get all these gun possession cases in there, in there and there is body camera footage uh, with those cases, and we see a very, very, very clear strategy of the Chicago Police Department um, to take, um, to, 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 they enact in very particular neighborhoods where they just pull people over one by one by one by one and try to get in the cars and try to find guns, right? So I suspect that Stanley's eventually gonna get pulled over and I suspect they're eventually gonna find a legal gun on him, I changed his name. Um, and I wonder if my community wins in that result. I, I, I cannot deny the state's interest in reducing the amount of guns in our community. But I can't get around to the idea that making folks like Stanley a felon is a good public safety decision. And we see that over and over and over again. People choosing to carry, not because they feel like they are going to go, want to go shoot somebody, but that they feel genuinely scared. There's a great study from the Joyce Foundation talking about why, why we carry that kind of talks about this. So when I think about the public defenders in New York, uh, I think that they kind of have that same experience. I think that they are convinced that there is a significant failure in our collective strategy to felonize gun possession. I think that they note the arbitrary and expensive barriers to legal possession. I think in New York, you had to pay $400 and you had to ask, ask the police and the police could say no. I think they see the racial discriminatory law enforcement approach toward possession. I think that the their brief said something about like 14 or 17% of New Yorkers are black, but about 80% of people who are arrested, we have similar numbers in, in, in Illinois. Um, if those numbers are a little bit off, sorry, it's budget season, my braid is mush. Um, and they see this kind of legal fiction um, that you are a violent felon if you illegally possess, that, that illegal possession is a violent kind of act. Now if you get your license from the state and you carry, that's not, that's fine, it's legal. But if you possess illegally, you don't have the $400 suddenly you're a violent felon. So suddenly you're a violent felon. So um, I think that's where they're coming from. You know, as opposed to the NRA thing, you know, as somebody who's come from this, who comes from Chicago, who cares about our community, um, who wants our community to be safe and wants our folks to be treated safely, I, I can't base my opinion or what I see based upon what some other organization um, decides they want to do. I, I think it's kind of reductive. It's 
very easy to say, oh, you're on the side of the NRA. I, I think that's like super simple. And, and maybe just because of me, you know, like my background has been in policy and, you know, I fought for, um, you know, policies that reduce, you know, gun crime. I, I fought for gun dealer licensing and I got death threats. So to say that like, you know, people who think like me, who both want to keep our community safe, but acknowledge the faults of a current scheme around felonization, to say like they're on the side of the NRA, that's, it's, it's, you know, in, in this case, yes, but generally, no, I don't think the NRA has my community's best interests at heart. I think they want to sell guns, right? So um, that's kind of where I'm at. Thank you so much for having me. I'm enjoying the sun and looking forward to the conversation. Great. Well, thank you for starting us off. Um, so now I'm going to pass things on to Professor Olson. Um, your recent research has looked a lot at patterns in sentencing. Um, for weapons offenses in the United States. And I think one of the things in particular we were hoping to get out of your contribution is, you know, what patterns do we see in sentencing? Do we see racial disparities in terms of who's being prosecuted and what those outcomes are? Um, what can looking at data um, in this area um, shed light on in terms of how, um, how, how criminalizing gun possession is affecting um, different communities? Right. Thanks. So, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, oh, hopefully you can tell that Sharon and I share the same tailor. And, and we said, just give us a shirt that, that looks close to UCLA blue. So hopefully hopefully they pulled it off. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the work we've done and, and frame it in the larger context of the justice system's response to uh, violence, gun violence, and illegal gun carrying in particular. Uh, when we started this work, uh, some people came to us and said, we want you to study and help us understand violent gun offenders. Um, and so as, as social scientists, and, and a shout out to, to whoever thought to have a few social scientists thrown in. Uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity <laughs> to participate. Um, in Chicago, in the last uh, decade or so, there's been this refrain from elected officials about uh, we need to do more with the violent gun offenders. Um, and they talk about the violent gun offenders they were arresting and the violent gun offenders that were being released from pretrial detention. Uh, and really what they were talking about were people charged with illegally possess possessing a gun. Uh, they, they conflated the two. They, they portrayed to the public that people who are illegally possessing a gun, to, to Sharon's point, are, are violent individuals. And part of what complicates it is Illinois law describes the behavior of carrying a, a concealed handgun if you do not have a license to do so as aggravated unlawful use of a weapon. Uh, and so when the public hears that, they assume you're, you're out there shooting people. Um, so when we started, we, we, we kind of took a quick look at uh, crimes committed with a gun that are in fact violent, uh, armed robbery, aggravated battery, and, and didn't find a whole lot of interesting stuff there from the standpoint of social science. Uh, most states are pretty consistent. Um, in most states, all of these offenses are mandatory prison sentences. They have enhancements. They're subject to truth in sentencing. Um, so not a, not a whole lot of interesting stuff about how the justice system responds to violent crimes committed with a firearm. But when it comes to illegal firearm possession uh, and how that's viewed and how that's responded to, that's where we saw some, some real interesting stuff. Uh, the first thing that's important is it varies a lot across the states as to what is actually illegal. So the behavior in Chicago uh, where uh, Sharon's a friend or, or a 22-year-old who has a handgun for self-protection but does not have the permit. Um, their behavior is a felony. It's a mandatory one to three years in prison. Uh, that exact same behavior in uh, a large number of states is not an illegal behavior. Uh, in states with permitless carry or so-called constitutional carry, you don't need a permit. You don't need to go through a licensing process. And so just looking at that, the behavior that's defined as illegal varies a lot from state to state. But even in those states where that behavior is illegal, the punishments vary from uh, misdemeanors all the way up to Illinois' example and, and New York's where it's a non-probationable uh, felony. Um, so as we started, we realized there wasn't a lot of research that's looked at how are people charged with illegal gun possession uh, handled by the justice system? What are the outcomes and those kinds of things? And so I want to start kind of broadly, um, start as I'm halfway through my comments, uh, <laughs> but, but start with kind of the beginning of it all. And, and it, it starts with, with law enforcement making the decision that they are going to either uh, aggressively look for illegal firearm possession um, or 
uh, respond to what may be an increase in the illegal gun carrying. So one of the things we've looked at, I was going to show a picture, but I don't necessarily think I need to. Um, if you look at trends over the last uh, 40 years in arrests for uh, what are described as weapons offenses, but are really illegal uh, firearm possession offenses, the trends in arrests mirror the violent crime rate uh, almost exactly, and the homicide rate almost exactly. And so the question is, do arrests by law enforcement for illegal gun possession, um, do they just reflect gun carrying? You know, as, as violent crime goes up, are more people carrying guns? Uh, or is it because more people are carrying guns that violent crime is going up? Or what we think and what we focus on is going after the guns, the proxy for going after the violent crimes committed with a firearm. Uh, because the clearance rates are so low for violent crimes committed with a firearm and police are told to do something, that's something they can do is really pay attention and, and look for guns. And so it, it's likely that there's a lot of those things going on. It's a simultaneous issue. Uh, is the gun arrest going up because of changes in law enforcement, changes in behavior, um, or what? And so um, we can at least point to plenty of examples where the police declare we're, we're going after guns. We're looking, at, looking for guns. And shortly thereafter, uh, no surprise, you see a big increase in arrests for those. Um, the arrests, at least based on our research, are not uniformly spread out across the country. Uh, they are concentrated um, in large cities, in states that have restrictions on, on carrying and, and licensure processes. But even in those large cities, like Chicago, it's not evenly spread out. It's concentrated in very specific communities. And so the research we did in Illinois found I think it was somewhere around 40% of all the people arrested and convicted for illegal firearm possession uh, were arrested in 11 neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, that's for the state as a whole, uh, what, what's driving it. And the challenge or the complicated thing is it's the communities with the highest rates of firearm violence. It's where the police are concentrating their efforts. And so what we see is the arrests are in some ways where you would expect them to be, where the highest rates of of gun violence are. But the means by which those arrests are being made um, is most often as a result of traffic stops, uh, where the police are using the, the, the Illinois Vehicle Code, as a, a friend of mine in law enforcement said, is the best friend of police, uh, because they can use the vehicle code to make a stop for almost anything. And in the course of that, again, when there's pressure to look for guns, uh, they will look for guns and find them. Um, Importantly, that isn't the approach in all communities. Uh, there's plenty of communities that, that we've done research in and talked to law enforcement in. We talk about this issue. Um, in, in many of the smaller rural jurisdictions, they say, we don't look for guns. Everybody's got them. It's no big thing here. Um, so in those communities, uh, while it's illegal to, to have a concealed uh, firearm or, or a firearm in your car if you're not licensed, they don't see it as an issue. Uh, the gun culture suggests that it isn't a concern. And so they use their discretion to not make arrests. Uh, and if they were to make arrests, it's likely that the prosecutor would also use their discretion to not pursue charges because of the, because of the gun culture. So one of the, the, the things we kind of put out there for, for people to wrestle with is, uh, should the police look for people illegally possessing guns? Um, and if they find somebody illegally possessing a gun, what should they, what should they do? Should they make the arrest? Um, in Illinois, the challenge is really what does the prosecutor do? Um, because again, I described under Illinois law, this is a mandatory uh, prison sentence. Uh, the law was changed around 2011 uh, that made this a non-probational crime. What we found in our research was the only jurisdiction uh, that imposed this policy and used it and, and resulted in almost all people going to prison was the jurisdiction where Sharon's the public defender in Chicago. In the rest of the state, prosecutors exercise their discretion um, to not charge at that level or to plead down to a different type of, of case. So the consequences in Illinois are the majority of individuals subject to this law are the people who are living in 11 neighborhoods in Chicago, um, almost exclusively African-American men between 18 and 24. And so we, we wanted to try to expand this to get a better understanding of it, and we looked at other states. Um, we actually tried to look at all states, but really what we found was 
It really doesn't make sense to look at some states because there's very few of these cases because there's very few instances where this behavior is illegal. Um, so we looked at a few states and, and a couple of things we found that I think are, are helpful to think about wrestling with this and then I'll, I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. Um, it's really limited to very specific counties in specific states where you see the greatest impact of uh, the application of this law and its disparate impact on, on communities of color. Um, just to give you some numbers, because I'm a, a quantitative researcher and I've got to use numbers, right? Um, about a third of all the people sentenced to prison uh, for illegal gun possession in the last few years were sentenced to prison from Illinois, New York, and California. So those three states made up about a third of all the people going to prison uh, for gun possession. Put a finer point on it, uh, more than one out of every 10 people going to prison were sentenced to prison in Cook County, which is Chicago, and Los Angeles County. Um, so it's, it's because of the laws in, in, in specific states and how those laws are applied in specific communities that you see this, this impact. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say, because I do want to make sure I point out the issue about how there may be racial bias or, or, or racial disparity, um, it's clear that people being arrested for illegal gun possession are not representative of the communities or the population. Uh, in the research we did in Illinois, we found that race had no effect on who was sentenced to prison or who was not sentenced to prison. Um, so once the case has been made, once the person's been arrested, it doesn't appear that there's any racial disparity uh, after that point. Right? But keep in mind, the biggest factor that influenced the, the sentencing was what jurisdiction was the sentence being imposed in, and, and that was primarily... Um, Chicago. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and have my other colleagues chime in. So. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so next we wanted to turn to Professor Barragon. Um, you, as a sociologist and criminologist, you've actually taken this important step of actually asking people um, who, who, who have been arrested for gun possession here in Los Angeles County, you know, what are their perceptions? What do they think about um, this, their, their own criminalization, which I think is a really um, bold step to take um, in your research. Um, and so we wanted to hear more from you about how those who are directly impacted understand these prosecutions. Um, and related, and that was also part of the readings that were assigned um, for this particular panel. So if people are interested in reading that particular research project, it's, it's available on our website. Um, and you've also looked at enforcement of gun um, violence from, on the policing side. Um, so um, connecting, connecting to some of Professor Olson's comments about the discretion of the prosecutor, we're also interested in learning more about the discretion on the ground in the, at the enforcement stage. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for having me. So for those that might have not done the reading that was on the website, I'll just give a quick synopsis of what that study was. So um, back in, I think it was like 2013, 2014, um, I and a few other colleagues interviewed 140 individuals that were detained on gun related charges in LA County. And the whole purpose of that study was to understand how the illegal gun market works from the perspective of those that have been detained on these gun charges because they're the ones that arguably we should care about most in deterring from that illegal possession. Um, so learning how they think about the law and how they think about um, their punishment, why they carry, those were really the motivating factors for that study. Um, so 82% of the people that we um, ended up interviewing um, were um, illegally banned from carrying a firearm and they were well aware of it. About 7% said that they were um, legally able to possess and the other 10% we really didn't have um, that information on. So in addition to knowing that you know, they were not allowed to carry, um, what we ended up finding is that they were pretty familiar with the law as well. Um, one of the central um, features of deterrence theory is that if you do not know the law, it cannot deter. Um, so we were pretty perhaps unsurprised, but surprised at the same time, given that they were in the adjudication phase of their sentencing, that they had some familiarity. But nonetheless, um, they were able to describe some of like the patchwork of laws that exist in California, particularly when it came to punishment. Um, but the more, I think, intriguing part is the fact that clearly by virtue of where they're sitting, the law did not deter their behavior. 
So unpacking why that is um, has really motivated the rest of my kind of work as a, a gun violence scholar. And what we learned from this particular sample is that this very real fear of safety um, drives that motivation, just like it drives anyone else that wants to protect their home. They want to protect themselves and their livelihood and their loved ones. But they very, very clearly point to the discriminatory ways in which the law is enforced um, and also how their sense of self-defense and protection is not valued in the same way because they carry this felon label. Um, many of the respondents that we spoke to identified um, very explicit experiences with police harassment, with neglect, where they're seen first as a suspect and um, as a victim second, if at all. And so those experiences with how the law is enforced um, has a reverberation um, in terms of their own perceptions of the legitimacy of the law. And there's quite a bit of research now around um, the impacts of legal cynicism on um, uh, criminal behavior, but particularly um, gun behavior. The more that a person views the law um, in a cynical way, that it does not serve them, um, the more likely they are to carry a firearm. And that um, finding bore out um, within our own study. And so some of the questions that have really come up for me have been, how do we ensure the protection of those that feel most vulnerable? when we're still relying on the same legal tools that also make them feel um, physically vulnerable and um, unsafe. Um, so in terms of enforcement, um, what came out in the, that particular study is that it was very much these routine enforcement practices that were getting them caught up, um, being stopped while they were walking to the store, um, being stopped while um, they're driving, um, and, you know, some people claim that guns were planted on them. Some claimed that they actually did have a firearm, but their justification for that possession, because they were um, uh, branded as a felon given prior offenses, did not allow them to legally have that, um, that gun. And so I'm, I'm very interested to hear kind of how the conversation will go around um, kind of where we move next given that we know that the police um, historically in high violence communities have very tense relationships with those residents, given that we know that violence in these communities is the highest. When do we say that our reliance on those same legal mechanisms is no longer serving that community? Um, and it definitely comes through in, from the voices of those that have been incarcerated, but also from people that are doing the groundwork of trying to stop gun violence in their communities. They understand that you know, people carry to protect themselves, but they also understand that simply sending them to prison or arresting them, branding them a felon, isn't also going to um, minimize gun violence in their community. And so the state has now started, I think, to um, consider some of the ramifications of some of our extreme policies We've seen some changes with sentencing enhancement policies that um, are currently underway, where judges now have discretion in some cases to not apply mandatory minimums um, when it comes to gun cases, but only if it's not branded as a violent offense. And so how we define um, <clears throat> these types of crimes as violent or not violent and how we intervene and potentially divert people from the criminal justice system um, is really where some of the respondents that I've interviewed have suggested we go next. Um, and given you know, the research we have that suggests that enhancements don't work. Incarceration only works so much. Um, criminal law really, in, in my perspective, is kind of where we should be focusing our, our efforts on um, to really reduce gun violence. Great, thank you. Um, so next, um, Professor Britta, we wanted to ask you some questions about your important research that's really focused on uh, people's perceptions about the uh, right to bear arms. And you've also actually done research on people's perceptions around the concealed carry laws. Um, 
and so and and also why people would support concealed carry laws and and conversely why some people would feel less safe if people are concealed ca carrying um, firearms so we wanted to learn from you um, sort of how this research could contribute to thinking about um, potentially some solutions which I know we're going to be turning to next okay great um, thank you to UCLA and to the Gifford Center for including me on the panel today um, you looked in the community. I'm going to step in aside and look at kind of a micro community, which is our schools, and talk a little bit about high schools. Uh, I do do some campus carry for universities and college as well, so maybe return to that later. Supreme Court recognized in Heller, McDonald, and then again in Bruin that there are certain sensitive places where guns are not allowed. and uh, Although states can decide and schools can decide for universities and colleges, pretty much universally for high schools, this is a sensitive space and guns are not allowed, even in Texas. And so the data I'm going to talk about today looks at Texas. And I want to look at, you know, why do students decide to bring guns to school in the first place? And uh, I did this work with Dr. Dahlia Stoddard. And again, Texas has some of the most permissive gun laws in the entire United States. But youth are not allowed to carry in school. And carrying in school is a third degree felon and also comes with mandatory expulsion from school. So some pretty severe consequences. There have been several studies, national studies, that look at School gun carrying, CDC puts out data every year, and there's nothing wrong with those. But um, our exploratory study, we decided to do it for two specific reasons. First of all, those larger studies almost always ask high school students about their gun carrying when they're either sitting in a high school classroom or at home, two places that they are likely to be quite afraid that if they report they're gun carrying, there could be consequences. Um, the second element here, well, to get around that, uh, and it took being a little bit creative, but there was a program at a local HBCU near where Dr. Stoddard was working that incoming freshmen would take classes. So here you have a group of students that are between two weeks and a month removed from their high school experience. So they can reflect and give honest uh, and truthful answers about that, but they're no longer in an environment where they would fear that either their high school is going to find out or their parents are going to find out right away. So our hope would be they'd be more truthful. And as I mentioned, we did this at an HBCU. Um, in the South, a large majority of the students self-identified as Black or African American. Um, as you can tell from the past two days, there's a clear racial subtext to almost all discussions of gun policy. Yet, a lot of these studies, even the big ones, don't have large enough samples of minority youth to make meaningful comparisons. At the same time, we all recognize that the minority youth are disproportionately impacted by gun violence, so they're more likely to be victims. This was one of the reasons we felt that, you know, the research should be centered around them. We should know about their decision making. Um, we borrowed several, you know, as social scientists often do, we borrowed questions from the literature. The theoretical framework we wanted to look at is collective efficacy, and I won't go into it that much other than to say we wanted to look at the school environment as a micro community, and maybe there were issues in that micro community um, related to physical and social disorder, uh, perceptions of safety, perceptions of places that they needed to avoid in the school. Also, the idea of collective efficacy, how much they trusted the people around them, how much they shared the values of those around them, and police efficacy, were the police in in their schools, did they perceive them doing a good job? So first of all, we interviewed about 500 people, 500 students, 15% of them 
reported that they had carried a gun at least once to high school in, during their senior year. Um, so to give you an idea, the national studies for Texas for black students usually find between 6 and 8 percent. So this was a much larger number. We think it's because of methodology. Um, but again, it's an exploratory study, so repeat, it needs to be repeated. So why do black students choose to carry guns to school? First of all, the strongest predictor, which speaks to my, the work of my other three panelists, was neighborhood gun carrying. If you were afraid in your neighborhood and felt, you know, you had to carry a neighborhood, when you went to school, that gun went in your backpack. And so this was the stronger predictive predictor teens who avoided specific places in their school so if there were stairwells or um, different meeting places that they avoided and teens who felt unsafe in their school were significantly more likely to carry a gun um, likely to protect themselves and for self-defense now victimization there's an unfortunate correlation between victimization and offending. Um, and our initial models showed that victims were more likely to carry a gun. When we introduced collective e efficacy, this idea of trusting other people and feeling like they had a safe place and they were valued, the relationship between victimization dropped out. And so that this means that collective efficacy at a school can serve as a protective factor against gun carrying. Not unlike what um, the panelists from yesterday's community violence interrupters were saying, um, having that group that can help you through those experiences can reduce the chances that you feel like you have to carry a gun to protect yourself or that you feel like you have to retaliate. Also notable, for social scientists, it's always, not only is it the relationships that you find, but it's what you don't find that can be meaningful. Physical and social disorder, so things from all the way from graffiti to metal detectors did not have an impact on whether they chose to carry or not. And per perceived police efficacy, absolutely no impact on whether they chose to carry a, a gun or not. So. I'll stop here, and then I know we'll talk about interventions soon. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to talk about next. Um, so sort of the first half, we've been looking at um, you know, actually how criminalization plays out on the ground and particularly um, disparate racial impacts of criminalization. Um, and so now we want, I wanted to just ask each of you if you could um, sort of give us your suggestions for potential interventions. You know, are you thinking that we should be reducing crimi criminalization or using criminalization at all? Um, and if not, you know, what are other interventions that we should be um, pursuing to address the issues related to gun violence? So. Um, can I start back with back with back with you, Sharon? Sure. Um, so I, I'm pretty pragmatic. I, I you know, before I, I became the public defender, um, I, I worked in policy. I've worked real hard to try to pass laws, and I, to me, it's very difficult for me to talk about like the decriminalization of gun possession. I just don't think that's Ever going to happen in my lifetime is where I live, right? Um, what I what I do think is that um, you know there are high costs to uh, giving someone a felony, right? Um, and I would love for us as a as a as a system um, to be exploring uh, options outside of felonies. Um, I, I think uh, the, the second piece I think is really interesting. I'm kind of getting the weeds in uh, Illinois code. Um, I don't I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I've looked at them in the past. Um, you know, many times our, our clients are arrested for what we call UUW, unlawful use of a weapon, or aggravated unlawful use of weapon is because they are a felon, right? Um, but we know that a significant amount of felonies. Um, arise from conduct that um, many people would not regard as incredibly um, indicative of violent behavior or to be a, you know, you're, you know, 
maybe it's a mistake or something of that, of that nature. So I'd be interested in exploring, like, what are the things that bar legal access to guns, right? Um, again, I am not a person who wants to, you know, sell a bunch of guns to people. Um, but I do think that the barriers that we present to legal use have secondary consequences um, that um, I think are very central to public safety. I think oftentimes when we have conversations about public safety, they center around like preventing people from shooting each other, and that's obviously important, right? But I do think it is a massive concern of public safety if someone becomes a felon or someone picks up a second felony and now they can't provide for their family, right? So there are public safety consequences if uh, you know Stanley is shot or um, he shoots somebody. But there are also massive public safety consequences if Stanley loses his job and he can't afford like to pay his um, his mortgage, right? Um, so uh, those are my, those are my thoughts. Um, I I think I I kind of group the solutions into different categories depending on the population that's involved. I think Sharon pointed out the issue with those who are uh, convicted as a felon in possession, right? That that again in Illinois that's a mandatory prison sentence. I think the minimum is is five to six up to to fifteen years. Uh, the research we did found that the vast majority of those felony convictions that made them a felon were nonviolent offenses. They stem from from drug enforcement, which Sharon points out not only is, is viewed by many as not a, a dangerous or violent crime, but it's also a crime that gets generated from the same process of policing that we described earlier. It's contra concentrated in specific neighborhoods. So I think you know, one, one area is this issue of, of felons in possession and how to view that behavior. And again, in, in the research I've looked at, there are some states where there's a, a time window. After a certain number of years, the, the penalties associated with that uh, change dramatically. Uh, then there's the group that are 18 to 20 years old, which, again, under Illinois law, even if they wanted to apply for a concealed carry permit, they're prohibited from doing so because of, of their age. So that's a group that, you know, if we, if we made the application process easier, didn't impose a cost on it, implemented constitutional carry, there'd still be that group of individuals who would still be in violation of the law. And so the, the, un, the unsatisfying answer is, you've got to convince people to not engage in the behavior, right? You've got to somehow make them believe that they don't need to carry a firearm for self-protection. And, and I say that, that that's a challenge because basically you're telling them, don't believe what most people believe uh, that are obtaining a concealed carry permit, right? So granted, you have a much more objective risk of victimization than most people who have a concealed carry permit, but reject that and, and, and decide you don't want to carry. Um, and so I think relying on the criminal justice system to try to address that mindset is, is very difficult. We, we've got lots of great programs in our field to deal with substance use disorder and, and property related crimes by changing how people think about uh, the harm they're causing to the community and, and, and things like that. For this behavior to try to get them to change their thinking about that, you're trying to get them to change their thinking about their own public safety, which or, or their own personal safety, which I think is more more challenging. So, can I jump in real quick there? Yeah. And I, I think that's a I think I referenced it before, but that's especially difficult in the neighborhoods that we're talking about because there, there are elevated risk of, of of harm. That's definitely true, but there's also just the constant messaging that you are unsafe, right? Like you, you can't turn on the TV or um, go on YouTube or have a conversation with a family member without having a conversation about how unsafe you are. So you're really kind of really trying to drive or swim against stream when you're talking to, to young people about, uh, or talking to anybody about how safe they are. And there's a lot of great studies out there that suggest that reporting of crime outpaces folks' actual risk. And actually people overestimate significantly their uh, chances of being a victim of a violent crime. So 
It's going to be really tough for us to kind of figure out how do we talk people into believing uh, that they are safe enough not to carry because we're, we're not dealing with reality, we're dealing with the perception. Yeah, so um, I think kind of a, a similar suggestion kind of going along with what the other panelists are saying is just moving away from our over-reliance on police responses and punitive responses via punishment being the way to deter this behavior. And our panel yesterday on community um, violence intervention is clearly a step forward in that path but it's also looking at the law itself and thinking about how do we reduce some of these sentences or how do we even eliminate or minimize the possibility of imposing um, felon labels um, for some of these offenses, particularly possession, since that is what a lot of folks end up getting caught up on. So I think that is a very difficult conversation. Um, I don't know to the extent that, you know, California, for example, is gonna get rid of their enhancement policies or get rid of some of these really punitive policies that are the policies that are keeping people in prison for long periods of time that are contributing to the aging population in our prison. Um, if we want to really reduce the populations within our prison system and by extension, the harmful effects of incarceration on both individuals and families, we need to drastically rethink violent punishment um, and what we constitute to be um, a violent offense. So I think there is movement in that direction, but that's very much um, a place where I think more energy needs to be devoted. Um, but then also I think the flip side is really elevating, I think as this um, symposium is trying to do, the work that um, many communities are doing to, um, to bring about non-punitive, non-law enforcement oriented interventions to gun violence. It's just been in the last, I would say, five, six, seven years that there's been increased attention and funding to these types of programs, but they've been going on in communities underfunded, not funded um, for a long time now. So if we want to see the shift that I'm talking about with not relying on the law, we need to invest more in these types of interventions um, and really providing that infrastructure at um, the city government level, not just relying on nonprofits with soft money to be doing this type of work. So I think LA has done a lot in that regard um, where some of my other research is based in Richmond. Um, they've also done that in terms of instituting an office of neighborhood safety. Um, but it's, it's slow. And I think in order to make these responses robust and really have an impact, they need to be institutionalized um, at the city or county government level. Um, and that comes by way of voters, it comes by way of you know, advocacy, um, but that's kind of where I see some of the interventions um, taking place. Great. Great. Um, I'm actually gonna add my voice to the choir over here. Um, you can't arrest your way out of a school gun crime, a school gun problem or a gun problem in a community. There have to be uh, larger solutions. Um, looking only at school efforts are needed, and this echoes what you were saying about community, to like build micro communities, a sense of civic engagement, which enhances this feeling that you're safe around other people. Um, for youth, access to caring adults to share concerns with and increasing youth's own sense of agency. So it's not all about punishment, but what can they do to uh, help in their high school? We've already listed a number of different programs, but restorative justice practices and other alternative approaches keep youth in school and help them to reintegrate to the school community. Um, when youth feel safe, valued, and that their opinions mattered, they are less likely to carry guns to school and their friends are less likely to carry guns to school. Of course, you can't forget kind of the foundational 
the foundation that this sits on, you still have to have efforts to address structural inequalities in our education system, in our neighborhood, and any effort to, to work on that will also help uh, with the gun problem. Something that was not lost on us when we were doing this research is in our sample of about 500 youth, over 70 students had carried a gun uh, in high school. So this is a large number. When they participated in our study, they were starting a university career. So they could have just as easily pretty much by chance been in the school to prison pipeline that Harris County in Texas is so famous for. Um, but because of that chance, here they were, you know, working towards becoming productive members of society or, or being productive members of society for there. Great, thank you. Um, so we, what we wanted to do now is open it up to comments and questions from the audience. Yeah, we have, and we, we haven't been incredibly successful, um, uh, to be honest. Um, uh, we just haven't got much traction. I wish I could make it more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that's going to change at all post-Bruin in terms of additional? No, arguments? absolutely not. Okay. I mean, we're going to try it. Like, you know, we're, we're thinking, you know, and, I, and I'm quite frankly, I'm kind of new at the gig. So we, we have definitely thought about how we're going to build our, our strategic litigation portfolio, right? How do we use the size of our office, right? Um, going from a model where we are much more, uh, you know, we're, we're not independent contractors, right? We're, you know, 425 attorneys moving kind of together. Um, so, you know, I don't know if there have been, um, as many collective efforts pro Bruin, so you know maybe there's something to look at. But certainly, there have been a number of cases. You know, uh, that, that actually a couple of cases we're talking about came out of Chicago, right? And you know, there there has been some efforts, and um, you know, those just haven't been uh, hasn't drawn the success that we would hope. I'll, I'll kind of throw throw it back to you, Jake, just because again. A non-lawyer is talking, so everything I say that's completely off the wall, uh, ignore. <laughs> I'm barely but, a lawyer. But, but so this, I, this, this idea of, the, of the, the historical context, you know, what, what would the historical context say about possession of a controlled substance in, in the late 1700s or the, or the early 1800s? If, if that's what's driving the felony criminal history of a lot of these individuals that are prohibited, what would, what would that historical perspective be? So. First comment on his question. I, I'm a public defender in Compton, yeah. and uh, my experience with filing motions post Bruin to get cases dismissed is uh, judges in white communities like Lancaster grant the dismissals, and judges in African American and Latino communities deny the motion. Yeah. Uh, partially, it's because it's Democratic judges in Latin, Latino and Black communities, and in Lancaster, it's Republican judges. 
and they believe in gun rights. And so, not necessarily intentional racism, but it's built into the system. And it's part of the fact that we have such a huge county. Mm -hmm. but my question was, in California, but most gun possession uh, crimes are wobblers. Have any of you done any research on the filing discretion on whether the file is a misdemeanor or a felony, and if that's connected to race at all? And, and, and I, I'm from I'm from a foreign jurisdiction, so wobblers are, you could be a felonies and misdemeanors? Cases that can be filed into yeah. a felony yeah. order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> Sorry for the simple answer on that. Um, I do think, like, one of the areas where we need a lot more precision in the research is around decisions to file, how they get filed when it comes to gun-related cases, and there's just not that research at all. And I, I know that there was, because of like realignment um, and bringing down the prison population, I forget the um, judge's name, but she essentially ordered that um, mm -hmm we do research on enhancements, but that's kind of one penalty. It's not all gun-related charges. So I think there is some movement on trying to understand kind of how these decisions get made and what are the implications, um, particularly for racial disparities, but um, you have to have cooperative um, district attorney offices, a cooperative CDCR that could provide that information to, to get that data. And that's, I think, where some of the roadblocks have really been for researchers like me who want to do that research, but it's just been very difficult. I'd just add that I think in, in our context, the, the wobbler isn't the felony or misdemeanor. The, the wobbler is to file or not to file. Um, you know, and embedded within our law is you can seek the felony, but just leave out the part about the gun being accessible, and, and now you've made it probationable, right? So, so I don't. We haven't seen a lot of because there aren't a lot of misdemeanor offenses that it can easily fall into. So it's just how they interpret the the felony offense. One of the things that we have seen that unfortunately going to go away soon is that there was a program that allowed for a, a treatment of gun possessors who are, I think they're up to 20, or up to 18 21, to 20. 18, 20. Um, unfortunately, that, 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 that law is gonna sunset. Um, and there, I don't think there isn't, much, there isn't much data on that program because I think the clerk's office has not done a very good job of coding those offenses in the correct way in Cook County. Um, but I guess there could be um, some hope in reviving that program, but the political environment, which affects you know, both sentencing decisions, uh, uh, Rest um, is so toxic at this point. Um, I, I don't have a lot of faith that we're going to get many of those programs back. You may have just addressed this, um, Mr. Mitchell, but um, I was going to ask about diversion and whether or not there are diversion programs in Cook County for people who are arrested for simple gun possession. Giffords did um, a really fantastic report on potential for diversion to reduce recidivism and prevent violence. Um, it, it sounds like you were maybe just referring to yeah. a diversion type of project or program that is no longer being funded, um, which is uh, really unfortunate um, because there is some really good data on, those, on the effectiveness of those programs. Yeah, it's not, it's not even that it's not being funded anymore. It's, it's the law is sunsetting. So it was so it's funny, kind of a you know the, the, the creation of that law um, was in twenty was it when's Kwame's past twenty no was it no it was before that Kwame's law I think it's twenty oh maybe it's twenty eighteen wow could be twenty eighteen there there was a there was a, the last time we uh, increased penalties um, you know the advocates you know jumped up and down and talked about what we're talking about now how you know gun possession you know you know. Increasing penalties on gun possession doesn't make us safer. It makes our communities worse. So um, the kind of bone that was thrown to the advocate community was this diversion program. But because we live in an environment that is, uh, you know, incredibly, um, uh, I think, suspicious of, quote, unquote, treating gun offenders or treating repeat gun offenders, um, you know, in a, in a soft manner, 
they put a sunset on it. Um, and there has not been a lot of uh, you know, interest in extending that sunset, right? So it's a, it's a political issue uh, that we're trying to work through. Relatedly, in the, in the research we did, we because the, the law that made it mandatory was, was at a certain point in time, we had a kind of a unique opportunity to look at the people sentenced the year before the law and the people sentenced the year after the law. Um, before the law, most people got probation. After the law, almost everyone got prison. And we looked at the two groups and looked at their, their, their post-sentencing outcomes, and they were identical. The, the recidivism rates were identical. Both had really low rates of new arrests for violent crime, really low rates of, of arrest for, uh, for gun crime. So at least there's evidence that we've got to offer that sending people to prison doesn't gain you anything um, other than a good talking point. So. Also, if you have any um, data surrounding people then on parole or probation who then are um, rearrested or you know just stopped on the street um, because they can be and they have no right against you know search and seizure, um, and what that says when so many um, people who have are now on diversion programs or coming out of prison are still going to arm themselves. Um, and then at a certain point when, you know, you're seeing this in Compton over and over and the DAs just keep charging and you can see the rap sheet and it's just, you know, a gun situation got them into the system in the first place and then that's just, they're just recidivism, recidivism over and over with guns. At a certain point, you know, there's no, how is there no meaningful conversation about that, our current regime of just arresting people and sending them to jail or doing a punitive measure, measure on their guns? Like, it just seems, how is there not even a realization, it seems like, from prosecutors or police that it's just not even working? I'll answer it. I'll try to be quick. Um, so, so in Illinois, when you're released from prison, you're on something called mandatory supervised release. And if you get arrested for, for some specific offenses, it's required under law that your parole be revoked. Recently, illegal firearm possession was added to that. And, and so again, when you look at it, the, in quote, the recidivism rate of people returned to prison has gone up, in part because enforcement of gun laws in Chicago have gone up, and as a result, these individuals are, are coming back on that. And, and you know, the challenge that, that Sharon faces and that I face trying to provide objective information, again, is, is people refer to these as violent offenses or, or violent gun crimes. So most people, when they hear that violent gun offenders are returned to prison, they're like, good, that's, that's the way it should be, right? Whereas it's, it's the same cycle that we've talked about. So. Yeah, in the back row. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we, we haven't tracked uh, that. So the, the reports of all those students are coming into the country and there's no coding or extension to do? Auto C? It, it makes like a block information. Yeah, we, we, so we haven't tracked, we don't track, that this, I mean, I'd have to look into, we track by offense. Um, and, um, yeah, our, our data just wouldn't pop up with that. That'd be more of a crime lab question that, yeah. you know, what are the types of guns and, and functioning that they're, that they're submitting. Does it, does it trigger a different type of charge as far as you're aware? No. So it took me some time, but I, I want to address the probation question um, just because it's something that came up in terms of people being stopped and why they were stopped and probation and parole being one of the reasons that police essentially have the legal right to stop anybody, right, and harass anyone because 
if they're on community supervision, they um, forfeit essentially their right um, to search and seizure. So that came up as one of the key mechanisms that led to harassment and to, that led to this cynicism towards police. Um, but in another context, so like it, it, it can, I think, reproduce the very behavior we're trying to, to deter. But in another context where it's come up in my research is around the diversion context. And so say you give someone probation, but then what are the terms of that probation? And do the terms of that probation still put that young person in particular within the crosshairs of law enforcement? Um, or does it make them vulnerable to recidivating because they no longer can live with their mom because their um, brother's gang affiliated and they were told by the judge that they can't live with anyone that's gang affiliated. So I think there's, there's still a need to, I think, really think how any punishment that's imposed, whether it's as light as probation or as severe as something like a, an enhancement, perpetuates the criminalization and the cynicism that can lead someone to want to continue to carry a gun. Um, so that's how I think about like the prob probation context. Um, I don't know if that was related to your question at all, but, but yeah. Other questions? We just have five more minutes, so I want to be sure we get in any other questions from the audience. No? Um, so I was, I'm really interested in this idea of legal cynicism that, that I think kind of is rippling through all of the, all of the different comments. Um, and I was wondering you know, if any of you have additional ideas of like how we can get at that, because it seems like this, um, you know, law enforcement's wanting to sort of stop you know, violence and using targeting of gun offenses as a way to do that. Um, but yet there's this feeling of lack of safety and lack of respect, even when you ask the people who are, you know, arrested for these particular gun offenses. So are there, are there sort of strategies that we could use to address that? I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Um, I think the police would say yes, that, you know, community policing efforts to improve relations between residents and, um, police officers is one way to, to get at that cynicism. But based off of my own observations of what some of these interventions can look like, like town halls, and um, there's still that legacy of cynicism that permeates throughout a community. So these kind of community policing oriented approaches, I think can only go so far. I think it really comes down to minimizing the role that police play in certain scenarios within a community. And so that's what some of these community violence interventions are trying to do. Um, so by having that distance and by having other types of interventions address the problem, um, I see potential um, ripple effects to, to that legal cynicism question um, by virtue of reducing the contact and the potential for harm. But yeah, I, I think those are probably the two approaches that I've seen. You know, I think there's a, you know, and this is, you know, again, I, I'm the, the least educated person on this panel, but uh, I, don't, I don't, this is not based upon a whole lot of research, just personal experience. Um, when we're talking about community policing, we're also talking about, um, I think there's a real firewall, right, between like community policing and the jump out boys, right? The guys that are, you know, you know, you know, hopping uh, out of unmarked cars and, uh, you know, pulling people over and pulling guys out of cars and, you know, you know, trying to find guns. So I've always thought that the community policing model is has such a limit, right? It, you know, you can get out there and you can, you know, be at the barbecue and you can uh, hang out with the six year old. Right, but it's a totally different group of folks um, that are, I think, um, you know, entrusted to keep the community safe. Um, I, I think another thing that, you know, if, if we're talking about that, that that legal cynicism, you know, 
thinking about how those individuals are treating the community um, is is something to be, uh, I think, discussed. Um, again, I mentioned it before. You know, we just watch tons and tons and tons of body camera, and we see the treatment, like just the general treatment, how somebody is treated when they're pulled over. Um, we see the uh, alleged uh, Fourth Amendment violations, um, and you see how, you know, one of the interesting things that we see is that, you know, we get this body camera footage, and in a, in one of the ways that police kind of mess with public defenders is um, instead of giving us the body cam footage of the stop, they'll give us the body cam footage of, like, the entire shift, right? But so we'll get to see, and we got to watch it all, right? Because, you know, you know we got to watch it all. And you'll see person after person after person who's pulled over, and you see those failed stops, right? Failed in their mind, right? Where they're not um, finding guns. But there's like a huge impact to that, right? Uh, if you get pulled over, you know, somebody's talking to you like crap, right? Uh, they're trying to get in your car. They say they smell weed and do all this type of stuff. You, get, you, 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 you create real disrespect and harm in the communities that you are uh, relying on uh, to 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 forward your safety efforts. So something that I think that we should be thinking about, you know, regulating if we do want to uh, improve those relations. Which I don't know; it, it may be too late. And I, I think it's a it's a long term issue yeah. as well. I mean, we we heard this morning about the the experiences with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's uh, Police. Those are decades of narratives in the community. Um, Sharon will probably, when I say it, he'll, he'll know what I'm talking about, but uh, some of you may have heard of, of a police commander in Chicago named Commander Burge, um, and he's, he's infamous in part because of the tortured confessions that he got out of murder suspects who were then sentenced to, to death row. That was in the, in the early 90s, uh, but the narrative in communities today is don't get burged. You know, the, the kids in the community know the narrative. Don't trust the police or they're going to burge you, meaning they're going to arrest you, they're going to torture you, you're going to confess to a murder, and you're going to be sentenced to prison. And all the barbecues in the world you know, can't undo that narrative in the community, and then all you need is, is one other case that highlights that issue of mistrust, and it, it, it goes south quick. So. Professor Britta, do you want to... Very Conclude quick comment. comment. <laughs> yes. Um, underlying a lot of this discussion is this concept of fear. And you have, you know, voters and the general public who perceive the gun issue one way, and then you have professionals working in the system or studying the system that see more of the nuance, and then you have people that are living in high crime communities. All of them are responding to fear in quite different ways. And general public, one of the classic fear response is just to punish more. And so they push the legislators to punish more, which leads to police being more aggressive and making more arrests, which leads to communities being feeling more unsafe and feeling like they have to protect themselves. Um, so, I don't know if this is a great closing, but I think we do have to think about fear and how you know our decision making isn't always the best when we're afraid, whether that's the decision to carry a gun or to vote to try to make penalties that much more severe and figure out ways to, to have these groups have conversations like we're having today um, to work out uh, options that are more manageable. Great. Well, please join me in, in thanking our panelists. Thank you.